Mark your calendars for RSNA 2024, Building Intelligent Connections. Join us in Chicago for the biggest week in radiology from December 1st through the 5th as we explore how to intentionally and intelligently build the right connections between people and technology. Expand your network, elevate your skills, and navigate the changes shaping medical imaging. Registration opens July 17th. Go to rsna.org slash annual meeting. Hi, my name is Katie Epstein from Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Welcome to the RSNA Radiographics Podcast. I will be talking about troubleshooting tips for diagnosing complex fetal GU malformations by April Griffith and colleagues. Congenital genital urinary anomalies are common with an overall incidence of 4.6% and can be complex leading to a diagnostic challenge for the radiologist. Majority of GU anomalies affect the upper urinary tract versus those involving the lower urinary tract and genital system. There is a wide range of congenital malformations of the genital urinary system with varying clinical impact, which range from transient urinary tract dilation to bilateral renal agenesis, a lethal anomaly. It is important to identify and accurately differentiate the GU malformation to help direct treatment decisions and assist in patient counseling. Ultrasound is the primary imaging modality utilized to assess the fetal GU system. However, MRI is a useful adjunct in troubleshooting more complex anomalies or when the diagnosis is unclear. The use of both ultrasound and fetal MRI are complementary exams and increase confidence in the prenatal diagnosis of congenital GU malformations. The four main categories we will discuss today include unilateral absent kidney, renal pelvis dilation, cystic parenchymal change, and megacystitis, also known as a large fetal bladder, and its mimics. We will first discuss unilateral renal agenesis versus renal ectopia. When one of the kidneys is absent from its normal location in the retroperitoneum, key imaging to obtain is a coronal color Doppler ultrasound image of the abdomen to identify the renal arteries. Variations from normal include absence of one of the renal arteries versus an unusual branch pattern from the aorta or iliac arteries, which can help distinguish between ectopic kidney versus true renal agenesis. Ectopic kidneys can be difficult to identify in grayscale images alone. Another imaging clue of an absent versus ectopic kidney is the lying down configuration of the ipsilateral adrenal gland. Unilateral renal agenesis is often an incidental finding with normal appearance of the urinary bladder, normal amniotic fluid volumes, and pulmonary development. Prevalence at birth is up to 4 in 10,000 newborns without associated fetal anomalies in 60% of cases. When additional anomalies are present, 33% of the time they are extrarenal, and 7% are associated with anomalies of the contralateral kidney or urinary tract. Characteristic fetal ultrasound findings is a single renal artery with compensatory hypertrophy of the single kidney. Fetal MRI is typically useful when other anomalies are present, in atypical cases with oligohydramnios, or when the ultrasound is limited given fetal position, maternal body habitus, or poor visualization of the kidneys. MRI can confirm the absence of one of the kidneys or presence of renal ectopia or fusion anomalies. Diffusion-weighted imaging is a very helpful sequence in identifying the kidneys. The renal parenchyma will be hyperintense. Bilateral renal agenesis is lethal, typically presenting after 16 weeks of gestational age with anhydramnios, lack of visualization of kidneys and urinary bladder with associated pulmonary hypoplasia. Associated genital abnormalities in the setting of unilateral or bilateral renal agenesis include absence or dysgenesis of the ipsilateral uterine horn and upper two-thirds of the vagina in female patients, and Zener syndrome, characterized by ipsilateral ejaculatory duct obstruction and semical vesicle cysts in males. Renal ectopia is secondary to abnormalities in migration or fusion, with absence of the kidney in the normal renal fossa compared to renal agenesis as just discussed. Fusion anomalies include cross-fused ectopia and horseshoe kidney. Horseshoe kidney is the most common congenital abnormality of the upper urinary tract with an incidence of 1 in 400 individuals 
Ultrasound images demonstrate fusion of the lower poles of the kidneys. However, in cross-fused ectopia, there is fusion of the kidneys in a linear configuration. Most commonly, the ectopic kidney superior pole is fused to the lower pole of the normally located kidney. This can mimic unilateral renal agenesis. Although a clue on the diagnosis is that the renal length is almost two times that of normal, with two renal arteries identified on Doppler ultrasound evaluation. Pelvic kidney, secondary to abnormal ascension, is the most common type of renal ectopia. Key imaging finding in all of these diagnoses discussed is that both the urinary bladder and amniotic fluid will be normal. Next, we will move on to urinary tract dilation, UTD, which is dilation of the renal collecting system and ureters. A recent consensus paper written from experts in radiology, pediatric nephrology, fetal urology, and MFM colleagues aim to standardize the terminology of renal pelvis dilation in both the antenatal and postnatal stage of life. Prenatal fetuses are either normal, low risk, labeled as UTD-A1, or increased risk, labeled as UTD-A2-3. High risk is when the renal pelvis anterior-posterior diameter measures greater than 7 millimeters at 16 to 28 weeks, or greater than 10 millimeters at greater than 28 weeks of gestational age. Other high-risk features include peripheral calicele dilation, increased renal echogenicity and or cystic change, visible ureters, bladder abnormality, and unexplained oligohydramnios. Depending on gestational age and whether the fetus is low or increased risk determines subsequent postnatal follow-up. Renal ultrasound should be performed greater than 48 hours after birth. Otherwise, renal pelvis dilation could be underestimated secondary to expected neonatal dehydration. When UTD is diagnosed in utero, there are a variety of etiologies, including reflux, uretopelvic junction obstruction, also known as UPJ obstruction, and dilated duplicated collecting system. First, let's discuss UPJ obstruction. UPJ obstruction is dilation of the renal pelvis and calyces with tapering at the UPJ with non-dilated ureter. If severe, it can lead to obstructive renal dysplasia or calyceal rupture with either urinoma or urinary ascites. Typically, this is an isolated finding. However, prenatal interventions may be offered in the setting of significant contralateral renal abnormality. Next, we will review duplex collecting systems. A duplicated collecting system occurs when the ureteric bud divides or duplicated prematurely and results in two collecting systems separated by a band of renal parenchyma, most commonly unilateral, although it's bilateral in 10 to 20% of cases. Complete duplication results in ectopic insertion of the upper moiety, often associated with uretocele, approximately 70% of the time, which can lead to obstruction. The lower pole inserts normally. Although reflex is typically seen secondary to disrupted lower UVJ junction mechanics from the ectopic upper pole ureter, sonographic findings include larger than expected kidney for gestational age, dilation of the upper moiety collecting system with normal or less dilated lower moiety. The lower moiety can be dilated, which is secondary to reflex. The degree of dilation can vary with urinary bladder distension. Uretocele is typically best seen on ultrasound when the bladder is partially full. It is key to image the bladder at multiple time points, otherwise this finding could be missed. Cine clips are helpful in documenting ectopic ureteral insertion. Most common site of insertion is the bladder, although it can be anywhere along the GU tract. MRI can be complementary and helpful in confirming an abnormal ectopic insertion when suspected on ultrasound or in more complex cases with obstructive cystic dysplasia of the upper pole. Follow-up in pre- and postnatal period is recommended given risk of obstructive cystic dysplasia of the upper pole moiety. Now we will discuss cystic parenchymal change in the fetus, which can be macrocystic or microcystic. The presence of cysts in the renal parenchyma is always abnormal, which differs from adults. The differential diagnosis is broad, Although key imaging features to assess include renal size, 
parenchymal echogenicity, unilateral versus bilateral cyst involvement, whether cysts are solitary or multiple, presence of other findings, and associated oligohydramnios, which is defined as a deep vertical pocket less than 2 centimeters, or associated anhydramnios, which is the lack of amniotic fluid. I will go into more detail regarding two of the most common diagnoses where we see macroscopic cystic change, including multicystic dysplastic kidney and obstructive cystic dysplasia. Starting with multicystic dysplastic kidney, also known as MCDK, key imaging findings include multiple non-communicating cysts interspersed with non-functioning renal parenchyma, which can be segmental or diffuse. The involved kidney is often markedly enlarged for gestational age with the parenchyma replaced by numerous macroscopic cysts without a collecting system identified. The contralateral kidney may be mildly enlarged secondary to compensatory hypertrophy. Segmental MCDK involving the upper pole can mimic a duplicated collecting system with associated cystic dysplasia as I hinted to prior. It is key to look for a lack of secondary findings including hydroureter or ureterocele in order to make the correct diagnosis. Bilateral MCDK is a lethal diagnosis and presents with anhydramnios and associated pulmonary hypoplasia given there is no functional renal tissue. MCDK is unilateral in approximately 80% of cases. However, contralateral renal anomalies are seen in 20% of cases, including UPJ obstruction, renal agenesis, renal hypoplasia, and reflux. In comparison, obstructive cystic dysplasia is a progressive process secondary to urinary tract dilation. UTD leads to increased renal parenchyma, echogenicity, and parenchymal thinning, and finally the development of cysts. Initially, cysts are small and peripheral in location and eventually are more variable in size and larger located throughout the parenchyma. Depending on the stage of the process, the kidney may be small in size for gestational age reflective of renal atrophy, or large in size. It is important to to determine the underlying cause. Although the differential is broad, it is helpful to assess whether it affects one, part, or both kidneys. Unilateral causes include severe UPJ obstruction versus segmental causes include duplicated collecting system with obstructed upper pole moiety. If bilateral cystic dysplasia is seen, then one should assess for a cause of lower urinary tract obstruction, which is most commonly posterior urethral valves in the male fetus. Other less likely differentials include urethral atresia versus prune belly syndrome. Although findings are typically seen on ultrasound, MRI is a helpful adjunct to determine the underlying cause, particularly when amniotic fluid is low to absent and in cases where both kidneys are involved. Next, we will dive into megacystis which is characterized by a large urinary bladder and most commonly secondary to lower urinary tract obstruction versus muscular dysfunction. In 30% of cases, additional findings lead to a diagnosis of a specific syndrome, including Beckwith-Wiedemann and megacystis microcolon intestinal hypoperistalsis syndrome, also known as MMIHS, or a chromosomal abnormality. Megacystis is defined as a bladder measuring greater than 7 mm in diameter in the first trimester, or a sagittal bladder dimension in millimeters greater than the gestational age in weeks plus 12 in the second and third trimester. Large bladder size and earlier detection signifies a worse prognosis. Differential diagnoses of megacystis include posterior urethral valves, urethral atresia, prune belly syndrome, and megacystis microcolon intestinal hypoperistalsis syndrome. First, we will discuss posterior urethral valves, the most common cause of lower urinary tract obstruction in a male fetus. Early imaging findings in the first trimester include large, often thick-walled and possibly trabeculated bladder with urinary tract dilation and echogenic kidneys. The bladder may demonstrate a classic keyhole sign of a large distended bladder funneling into a dilated posterior urethra. This sign is sensitive, but not specific for posterior urethral valves. Later in gestational age, beyond 14 to 16 weeks, when amniotic fluid production switches from placenta to the renal system, oligohydramnios or anhydramnios may occur. 
Lack or decreased amniotic fluid can lead to pulmonary hypoplasia and poor neonatal outcome. Marked bladder distension can lead to intraperitoneal rupture and subsequent urinary ascites or distension of the urachus. Associated severe UTD can also pop off secondary to calyceal rupture and result in a perinephric hematoma and or urinary ascites. However, these findings can be seen in any severe megacystis or severe urinary tract dilation. Treatment depends on severity. With no intervention occurring in those fetuses with normal amniotic fluid volume versus intrauterine vesicostomy, vesicoamniotic shunt placement, or serial amnio infusions may be performed in those with decreased or lack of amniotic fluid with the goal to improve survival by preventing pulmonary hypoplasia. The treatment yields no renal benefit. In comparison, urethral atresia is a rare cause of lower urinary tract obstruction that occurs in both males and females. Imaging features overlap with other etiologies of lower urinary tract obstruction. Key imaging findings are early marked urinary bladder distension, urinary tract dilation, which progresses to cystic dysplasia with decrease and lack of amniotic fluid seen earlier than typical after 14 to 16 weeks of gestation. Moving on to prune belly syndrome, which occurs in male fetuses in the majority of cases. This diagnosis is characterized by laxity of the abdominal wall musculature, a large distended urinary bladder with urinary tract dilation, occasional urethral dilation, and cryptorganism. In comparison to posterior urethral valves, the urinary bladder wall is often thinned without trabeculation, secondary to the underlying etiology, intrinsic muscle deficiency versus mechanical obstruction in posterior urethral valves. Imaging findings include marked distension of the urinary bladder, plasticity of the abdominal wall after voiding, decreased amniotic fluid volume, and possible dilation of the urethra. Dilated urethra is a characteristic finding of this disease, but not always seen. Undescended testes are an additional clue. However, this can only be assessed in the third trimester and can be seen on both ultrasound and MR. Definitive diagnosis is made after birth with identification of the classic flaccid abdomen. Finally, megacystis microcolon intestinal hypoperistalsis syndrome will be discussed, a rare smooth muscle myopathy that occurs mostly in female fetuses, ratio of 4 to 1. This myopathy results in massive urinary bladder distension and dilation of the ureters and renal collecting system. There is also functional intestinal obstruction leading to a microcolon due to hypoperistalsis. MRI is helpful in making the diagnosis, as T1 images can assess the course and caliber of the colon as meconium is bright, T1 hyperintense. There is also a decreased amount of T1 hyperintense meconium within the colon. Amniotic fluid volumes will be normal or increased in the, these fetuses, a distinction from the other etiologies of megacystis. Other fluid-filled structures in the pelvis can mimic an enlarged bladder. MRI is very useful in these cases to clarify complex pelvic anatomy. Lastly, I will briefly discuss a few megacystis mimics, including hydrocolpos, urogenital sinus, and colloidal malformation. Starting with hydrocolpos, marked fluid distension of the vagina, and or a lesser degree involving the uterus due to vaginal obstruction, findings can be seen in isolation when urogenital sinus developed normally and most commonly is secondary to an imperforate hymen. Other less common etiologies include a transverse vaginal septum or vaginal atresia. Images demonstrate a retrovesicular fluid-filled structure with or without a second smaller fluid-filled structure at the cranial aspect representing the fluid-filled uterus. The vagina distends more so because it is more pliant relative to the muscular uterus. It is key to ensure normal genitalia and anus are present on both ultrasound and MRI. MRI can be helpful to map the distal colon and rectum on T1 images with assessment of the rectal cul-de-sac length. However, ultrasound can visualize a normal anal dimple, excluding coexisting anal rectal malformation. Lastly, cloacal malformation and urogenital sinus will be briefly reviewed. Cloacal malformation results from a failure of the normal cloacal division by the urorectal septum. Classic cloacal malformation has a single perineal orifice from a small cloaca that drains the hindgut 
vagina, and urethra. Variations include two perineal openings instead of three with a common urethral and vaginal channel with a normal anus, known as a urogenital sinus. And colloidal dysgenesis is the most severe lethal form of colloidal abnormality with no perineal opening. Imaging features of a colloidal malformation include a distended vagina with fluid debris levels. 80% of these cases, there is a vertical linear septum extending in the vagina to the perineum. Fluid debris level is characteristic and occurs secondary to mixing of the urine and the meconium. This dilated structure in the pelvis can overlap and be confused with a distended urinary bladder. However, the fluid debris level, along with the absence of a normal anal dimple, are key findings of colloidal malformation. Other additional findings, including abnormal external genitalia and ascites due to retrograde flow of the secretions and fluid through the fallopian tubes, is seen. Meconium peritonitis can also be seen with peritoneal calcifications in the abdomen secondary to mixing of the urine and meconium, which is not related to bowel perforation. MRI is a very helpful adjunct to assess both the colon, internal, and external pelvic structures in these complex cases. Congenital GU anomalies are difficult and there are overlapping imaging features. Therefore, it is key to develop a standard approach in your assessment and be familiar with all the different differential diagnoses. Ultrasound and MRI are complementary exams and utilized together can provide diagnostic confidence, especially with more challenging cases. Neonatal outcomes of GU anomalies vary from no to minimal impact to chronic and end-stage kidney disease to lethal abnormalities. Therefore, it is key to be accurate in your assessment to help guide prenatal treatment, therapeutic planning, and parental counseling.